The following podcast is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. Thank you for listening. Change our home life. Change the way we educate our children. It is the presence of God He promised to leave. I will not leave you orphans. Dear brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is with you. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your host, Monday through Friday, here on the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us live on our beloved radio network, the Station of the Cross, Catholic Radio Network, where we tell the truth with clarity and charity. Our topic today is a difficult one and an important one. The topic is, what shall we expect of our American bishops? We're honored to have as our guest this afternoon, Bishop Michael Olson, the ordinary of the Diocese of Fort Worth, Texas. Welcome, Bishop. We're glad that you're with us this afternoon. Thank you, Father McTagg. It's very good to be with you and with all your listeners this afternoon. May we ask you to open our time together in prayer? Certainly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, thank you very much, Bishop. You know, I, I know enough about history to be sure that there is never an easy time to be a good bishop, and certainly recent weeks and months have not been an easy time to, to be a good bishop. Uh, in light of uh, revelations and declarations and so on, could you talk a little bit about what the past few weeks ha- have been, been like for you and, and your diocese? Well, I uh, certainly would be happy to do that. I, I would agree uh, with your assessment of history there, first of all, uh, that there's never uh, been an easy time to be a good bishop. And I would also add, I don't think there's ever an easy time to be a good Catholic, because uh, there's nothing easy about the cross. Right. Um, and the cross, especially that involves, by definition, um, uh, sacrificial love. Uh, I yes. think during these last several weeks, especially, uh, in uh, at least in, in my response to the diocese, has been um, caring for the, the faithful with regard to the effects of scandal. Um, mm-hmm. Scandal that is uh, not just simply shock and uh, uh, concern, or and more than that, shock and anger over behavior for people that have been entrusted with more and should be expected to do better, but, sh- but scandal in the sense that is discouraging of our call to live the gospel in its integrity, uh, because the effects of scandal are, are discouragement, and as we know, discouragement never comes from God. Right. Discouragement is all uh, from, from the devil. And so, in a sense, it's been a response uh, I've, I've been felt charged with to be more than just simply words, but first listening, and then action, uh, as much as in being present with the people liturgically, uh, sacramentally, and also effectively, uh, and also with my priests, um, and, and not being afraid to speak um, to the issues at hand as a bishop. Well, you know, Bishop, I, I speak to people from all walks of life and from many, many different points of, of view, and I have detected among them what you described as discouragement, as an after effect of, of the present scandal. And there are even some who say that, you know, it, it, it may be time to walk away from the church, uh, even to go so far as to say that we can't expect the grace of the sacraments because we don't know which of our priests are are good. What would you have to say to those folks? Well, um, it's never a call to walk away from the church, 
I think all the more reason that the baptized, as the Pope pointed out, who have the grace of the Holy Spirit through communion and full initiation sacramentally in the Church, are really to step forward, uh, to step forward in their baptismal vocation, uh, to uh, help to be a part of a solution, uh, and to contribute to that by speaking to the truth and calling to accountability um, to their own vocations, their bishops and their priests. I would further say, though, as far as the doubt that you expressed, um, there's nothing new under the sun. Of course, what they're sort of discovered, I think, is uh, the old Donatist heresy, which thinks that the efficacy of the sacramental grace comes from the minister of the of the sacrament, which is not true, um, as we know. Um, that St. Augustine dealt with that issue, I thought, very clearly, is that right. the grace is through the sacrament itself, uh, and right. imparted by Christ through the ministry, the instrumentality of the minister of the sacrament. So, um, really, I think they should dispel that, but I can understand why they would have those sentiments. Right. The the grace of the sacrament ultimately comes from the goodness of Christ and not from the goodness or lack of goodness of of, of any in individual priest. And, you know, uh, people are hurting and people are confused and uh, and, and people are, are angry, and, and understandably so. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering how this uh, affects you uh, as as a bishop. You know, there, there there are people who say that you don't understand what how hungry people are for a father until you become a priest, and there's some who say that you don't understand how hungry people are for a shepherd until you become a bishop. What's taking place in, in your heart now for your people in these difficult times? Um, a compassion, but also an incentive, really, to speak clearly. Uh, to speak clearly about what I'm able to speak clearly about. In other mm -hmm. words, that uh, uh, to really address these issues at hand, and especially to speak on behalf of the people as well, uh, to articulate that. Uh, my, my heart, really, though, is also directed because of, um, for my priests, all right, and uh, for uh, who are called to minister in these challenging times, uh, it, uh, my heart is also strengthened in that um, call to step forward and to lead, all right, and to lead as the Bishop of Fort Worth uh, for the, the faithful and in the 28 counties uh, of uh, this diocese, which is roughly the size of the, ge the geographic size of the Republic of Ireland. And that oh, is yes. simply the, the Holy, what, what the Holy Father is always talking about in reminding us as bishops is this, that we have our, our own vocation as a bishop uh, really is to teach, to govern, and to sanctify in the image of Christ, the head and shepherd of his church. We're fully ordained right. into that mystery. And right. so that requires that we be neither a wolf nor a hired hand. Right. right, and so um, you know, so as a bishop, I have to be informed, to be willing to be taught, uh, but then also to make the decisions that are mine to make as well as I can, and to speak as clearly about these things, um, especially mindful of those who are the weakest among us. All right, yes. and that would include um, those, you know, those who have been victimized, those who have been taken advantage of. All right, and it, and really, it includes everyone um, who is certainly a Catholic, but all souls uh, in this twenty-eight county area of the church. And so, um, I, 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 you know, I, I wish the Holy Father, and I, I pray for him, and he is, you know, the successor of Peter. But I, uh, but he wants me to do my vocational job, and not defer it to him all right so i mean we have the gospel before us we have the authentic dogma of the church the doctrine we have the right discipline that we can can uh, apply in the current circumstances as in anything and there's there's and we have natural law in the in the integrity of the conscience and so we have a lot to work with on these matters all right which are you know these, uh, we can say for sure these are complicated times Yes, yes, without a doubt, and especially in a postmodern um, influence on mo on these contemporary times. But that calls us as 
Catholics, and especially as me as a bishop, to simple-heartedness, all right, and to purity of heart, um, mm-hmm. and not to be distracted. You know, there's an old saying, the devil, the devil can't get you to sin, he'll keep you busy and keep you distracted, all right? right? And so to keep focused on Christ, and then also the responsibilities that are ours by office and by particular vocation uh, in the life of, of, of the church and the life of society to evangelize. Well, you know, I, I think there, there's always a, a, a temptation to make it somebody else's job to to outsource the, the, the responsibility to stand up and say, somebody should do something about this. Uh, but you know, I, I have the, the I have in mind that picture of of uh, Harry Truman on the um, you know that sign on on his desk that said you know the the buck stops here, and and that's yeah. that's a great challenge and and that's I think you know you might consider something like that for for your desk as well, Bishop. I know you you have been uh, very outspoken in in, uh, in your your written statements and your interaction with the media, and that's what we'll talk about in our next segment. Friends, when we come back, we will be on the line still w- with Bishop Michael Olson, and we're going to be looking at public station uh, public statements of Bishop Olson and other bishops and from Rome. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I'm Doug Barry, and this is your Battle Ready Minute. If you're a husband, then that means there was a day when you looked into the eyes of that woman who is your wife and vowed to love, honor, and cherish her until death. Ultimately, you promised to give your life to God by making a gift of yourself to your wife. The salvation of your soul depends on how dedicated you are to your marriage. As a husband, the most important duty you have been blessed with is to lead your wife to heaven. That duty includes caring for her and protecting her. And that doesn't mean just protecting her physically. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 reminds us that the devil is like a roaring lion looking to devour souls, even the soul of your wife. How are you fighting to protect her soul? It is the most important part of who she is. Pray and sacrifice daily for the salvation of your wife. Be the hero that you vowed to be. Remember, every day is training day, body, mind, and soul. Be battle ready. Are you prepared for the fight? Go to RadixGuys.com and sign up for our daily Battle Ready emails. The Station of the Cross invites you to join us each day for the Liturgy of the Hours at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, St. Paul tells us to pray constantly. The Liturgy of the Hours is a meditative and efficacious way to foster habitual prayer. Also known as the Divine Office or Breviary, the Liturgy of the Hours is the daily prayer of the Church and is made up of readings from sacred scripture, writings from saints and theologians, and small reflections. The Office of Readings is also read at 3 p.m. Eastern and helps us to unite in prayer with the Universal Church. For details about each hour and more information about the Liturgy of the Hours, visit thestationofthecross.com. We hope you will join us for this daily prayer of the Church each day at 5 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on the Station of the Cross. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call into the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Each morning, the Catholic Current sends out a short survey on the topic for today's show so that you can share your thoughts and any questions you might have. This is a great way to participate, especially if you aren't able to call in live. A few of the responses will be read over the air to add to the discussion, so make sure you sign up to receive our emailed survey at thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTigg of the Society of Jesus, your host for The Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network, where we proclaim the truth with clarity and charity 
Our topic today is what should we be expecting from America's bishops? And we have with us on the line Bishop Michael Olson of Fort Worth, Texas. In our first segment, we looked at the nature of the difficulties regarding uh, scandals that have been revealed in the past several weeks. In this segment, we're going to be looking at some of the public statements made by Bishop Olson and others. Bishop Olson, on July 28th, you uh, made available to, to the diocese and really to the world a very strongly worded statement regarding regarding uh, matters uh, in concerning Cardinal McCarrick. Could you summarize uh, for us what you said there, please? Uh, certainly. Um, I wanted. I, I wrote a pastoral letter instead of a statement regarding on July 28th because my primary motive and intention in writing the letter to the people of God um, in my diocese was to address the issue of scandal um, and just putting some principles forthright reminding us before our eyes, and that is, first of all, that nobody has a right to ministry in the Church. That's a grace Mm -hmm. that God offers, Mm -hmm. and it carries with it a sober responsibility, and that that is every ministry in the Church, including lay ministry, but Mm -hmm. in, in a particular way, the priestly ministry, the diaconal ministry, the ministry of religious life, the ministry of the bishop. All right, mm-hmm. and so it's based on a covenantal trust, and it's not uh, to be claimed ever as an entitlement. All right? right, so that even the ordination carries with it a sacramental character that is eternal. Right, it's mm-hmm. like with chrismation, and so does baptism and confirmation, right. for that matter. Um, with that, though, uh, does not come a right to ministry. All right, but rather a responsibility as part of that covenant. I wanted to put that out because um, at the time, uh, especially this was the the scandals were coming forward about uh, former Cardinal McCarrick, and especially how it involved a relationship that were very tied to sacramental realities and human realities, Um, Mm -hmm. that of a a young man whom he had baptized as an infant, that of Mm -hmm. seminarians and priests whom he had ordained. Uh, mm-hmm. in, in the sense of that, and that there was even much more at stake, even much, or at least something particularly at stake mm-hmm. uh, and significant here, uh, be- besides the very painful and unjust abuse of minors or even of vulnerable adults, and mm-hmm. that it did have something to do with us ecclesially. And I thought that to state it clearly, that I I thought that uh, it was an appeal to the Holy Father as well as to, um, uh, it, to for the canonical penal process, process that would take place, that laicization should be duly considered. That was a petition uh, to the Holy See in that sense on behalf of the people of God here, uh, right. and not, not demanding, but at least saying, mm-hmm. you know, th- this is something that has been so grave before by the parts of priests that it's a punishment that has been deemed appropriate and fitting, and that that should not be excluded uh, at all, just simply on the on, on any basis, except for a duly do, a due process of justice uh, to that for these purported victims. Okay. And also, want... the final point was that, yes, please. So, uh, just would say furthermore, real mm-hmm. fast is that. It also involves responsibility for those who who could have done something about it and knew about it but chose to cover up. Yes, and that's a very important statement. And we want our listeners to take advantage of this very generous bishop who's... uh, Basically, we have open mic for an hour with with an American bishop. This is a great opportunity. We want our listeners to be part of the conversation. Call us now at one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three, or you can text us at the same number one eight seven seven five one one five four. Eight, three. Uh, Bishop, one of the things that struck me about your, your pastoral letter regarding Cardinal McCarrick was, number one, you, you put all canonical and civil penalties on the table for consideration, and then also you said that uh, the, the person under the microscope need not be Cardinal McCarrick alone, but those who uh, had some dereliction of, of duty. That makes your pastoral letter relatively uh, d- distinctive. Can you, and I think that's what a lot of people want, want to hear about, what were the obligations of those who were in a position to know, and how might they have acted differently? 
Well, your question in, it does involve or invites a lot of speculation, right? And um, but I but so I'd like to to I guess uh, direct it towards the principles at stake. All right, yes, and that is simply. Um, those who would be responsible, first of all, are those who would care for people who would be taken advantage of, mm-hmm. all right, unjustly, mm-hmm. through an abuse of power, and particularly in an area of life, uh, a part of human life, sexuality, where people are most vulnerable. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Then also, in the sense that um, if if uh, things were approved to keep this quiet, like things like payments, um, uh, when in fact, we had as bishops, and I wasn't a bishop at the time, but I'm a bishop now, and I'm part of the member of the USCCB. We, we agreed in the charter that we would not enter into these types of agreements, albeit with misconduct involving minors. I think mm-hmm. the same principle would apply, right. right? And it does not seem to have been applied, and I think that's a question that needs to be asked and answered. All right, mm-hmm. in any investigation, which we now see is being is being promised. At the time I wrote the letter, there was no no thought of it, or at least there had been no statement regarding an uh, an investigation to come forward. Now, I mean that's, I mean now that's been brought forward. But I think that's something that I would like answered. Um, I think see uh, to see you know the, there's a priority of things here, and there's several points. Uh, there's the uh, care for for uh, the vulnerable and the weak and their mm-hmm. in protection of them. There's the integrity of priestly life. There mm-hmm. is the integrity of the the, re- the responsibility, the teaching and governance authority of a bishop and stewardship that's been entrusted to him uh, to be just. All right. There's also uh, transparency, which is really more of honesty. Now, there's limits to transparency in this way to be mindful especially of those who are vulnerable or who have been hurt. Yes. All right, that uh, so that you don't you know, obviously names and things of purported victims you don't want to say. Well right. that's gonna involve care. There's also care about uh, a good reputation for for those involved uh, 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 with an allegation to make sure of that uh, that that this is on but but of course, these are prioritized and hierarchized biased towards the most vulnerable, and so we have a responsibility to simply put: if you see something, say something. Yes. And, yes. Yeah. Bishop, we have a caller on the line. We have Joe from Boston, Massachusetts. Joe, welcome to the Catholic Current. What do you have to say to us today? Well, the first thing I'm happy that the bishop, as one of my leaders, is pointing to Christ and keeping us focused on Christ and the church he wants and started. I think it's going to be important. The second thing, I'm sure he's heard it, uh, we were raised three children. I'm angry about what's happened, trying to keep them act as Catholics. But the thing that keeps crossing my mind is that a leader is responsible, whether he knew or not, for the actions of people under their command. So my view is something very concrete needs to be done. And one thought I had is for any bishop or cardinal in which a parish priest was proved to have abused anybody, did they do a couple thousand hours of community service over the next five years? Well, well, thank you, Joe, for that suggestion. Uh, Bishop Olson, uh, what do you think of what Joe has to say? Uh, I think... I think Joe called for something concrete and right. that meant it, that accountability. All mm-hmm. right. And, and words themselves don't settle this. All yes. right. As if anything could, but you mm-hmm. see, it's, it's not enough for us to say we're angry. All right. And, mm-hmm. or even that we're sad, you know, or that we're even that we're contrite, you know, we right. have to be, you know, there has to be contrition, confession, firm purpose mm-hmm. of amendment, and then penance, all right? And so without any of those things, uh, without if any of those things are lacking, then we are, um, then so is real reconciliation, ultimately, you know? And uh, I think so I'd say I, I certainly agree with Joe's sentiments uh, mm-hmm. and, and his thoughts about something concrete. 
Right. I, I agree. Uh, you know, there are certain words that have to be said and there has to be so much more. Speaking of words, we want our listeners to be part of our conversation with Bishop Michael Olson of Fort Worth, Texas. Call us now at one 511 5483 Text at the same number if you wish. one 511 5483 When we come back, we're going to ask Bishop Olson, what does he think caused the problem? What are the roots? You want to hear what he has to say? Stay with us. We'll be right back. There's no better way to start your morning than with spiritual formation from a reliable source. That's why the Station of the Cross invites you to listen to sermons for everyday living Monday through Friday from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern Time. Tune in to hear real sermons from real priests on topics important to you and your faith. Allow these servants of God to preach the gospel in the midst of your busy life. They cover everything from the sacraments and Catholic tradition to contemporary issues and distractions from the truth. For details about upcoming episodes and for podcasts of past shows, visit thestationofthecross.com and click on Sermons for Everyday Living under the Programs tab. We hope you'll take advantage of this incredible resource and tune in weekdays from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern Time for Sermons for Everyday Living. This Divine Mercy Reflection is from the Diary of St. Maria Faustina. The saints know, love, and serve God and long to be with Him in heaven. St. Faustina expresses this in paragraph 1539. Today I said to the Lord, When will you take me to yourself? I have been feeling so ill and I have been waiting for your coming with such longing. Jesus answered her, Be always ready. I will not leave you in this exile for long. My holy will must be fulfilled in you. St. Faustina responded, O Lord, if your holy will has not yet been entirely fulfilled in me, here I am ready for everything that you want, O Lord. St. Faustina expresses her desire to be with Jesus in heaven, but also knows that she must first fulfill God's will. Do we long to be with Jesus and concern ourselves with fulfilling his will, or do we remain preoccupied with things of the world? This Divine Mercy Reflection is brought to you by the Station of the Cross. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call in to the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. If you miss any portion of today's show or want to listen to any past episodes, click the podcast link under the Programs tab at the top of our homepage, thestationofthecross.com. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your host Monday through Friday for the Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and his Catholic Church. You're listening on to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network, where we proclaim the truth with clarity and charity. Our difficult and challenging topic today is what shall we expect now from America's bishops? And we have one on the line with us now, Bishop Michael Olson of Fort Worth, Texas. If you've just tuned in, you should know in the first segment, we identified the scope and nature of the, the difficulties and recent scandals. In our last segment, we looked at public statements from Bishop Olson and others. In this segment, we want to look at what some of the roots and causes of the problem might be so that we can understand it better. And in the next segment, think about remedies. And we want you, our listeners, to be part of the conversation. Call us right now at one 511 5483 or text us at the same number at one 511 5483 Eight, three. Uh, Bishop Olson, I've had lots of people ask me, I'm sure they've asked you the, the same question, how, how did this happen? How did, we, how did we get here? How do we make sense of, of recent revelations? That, that is a good question, and I, I think, um, I, you know, we, we always have to begin with the fact that we're dealing with sin, all yes. right, and sin Sin, the sins of the abusers, uh, and then sins of omission on the parts of those who who might have uh, who were responsible for oversight and mm-hmm. governance of them. Um, I think 
Also, uh, following on that, the causes of that is um, that we're talking about something so so toxic, toxic and repugnant that um, there's a visceral reaction to just kind of, oh my God, I didn't just see that, right? Or yes. I was told that, yes. and and we and we replace hope for wish, all right, yes. and. And and we where hope, which involves courage, um, to to go further into that which seems repugnant and involves some sort of a committed action on our part, uh, right. well reasoned and prudently uh, prudentially applied. For well, I hope it's nothing, and it's probably nothing, and let's not let's not worry about that. And I think that's a sin of omission, you know, something that Pope Francis has talked a lot about and has called our consciences to, to, to accountability for is the sins of omission. And we, we sometimes we become so preoccupied with the sins of, that we commit or others commit even more than our own uh, mm-hmm. that we neglect those things that are our responsibility to do and right. that we don't do. Um, right. And I think what what happens then afterwards is that then we look for, and you know, in what's left of modernity, we look for a mechanized solution to mm-hmm. a human problem of sin. Right. So, for example, the Charter is an excellent document, and it's an excellent uh, form of positive law, and it has to be applied faithfully by human beings. All right. right? It's not in itself, uh, you know, it, it's a it's a policy and it's a positive law, but it has to be jurisprudentially implemented, as than anything with canon law. As St. As Paul put it, the law does not save us, but right. we're saved by grace, faith in Christ Jesus. And right. so we have to keep Christ always centered on that. What would Christ ask me to do? All right? He's present here now, you know, and... Um, you know, and I think um, with that comes a certain um, avoidance, all right, and distraction uh, than otherwise with that when we don't respond in kind. Uh, yes. And I think sometimes, you know, seminary, I, you know, and and just I think this is a hu- this is a in seminary you see a human proverb at play that's a really bad advice mm-hmm. uh, form, and that's. It is better to ask forgiveness than permission. And, and I used to tell the men uh, that I said, look, you know who never says that are those who've been hurt by other people's wrongdoing, you know, right. who who are now asking their forgiveness. All yes. right. We have to do things before something happens. Right. And that requires change so that we're responding to the human condition preventatively right pastorally and not simply reacting after somebody gets hurt and I right. think we, the response has to be yeah. I'm sorry the response has to be both truly human and truly Christian and when we're in great pain we're, we're looking for the nearest exit we're looking to, for the nearest uh, uh, remedy or escape. It's like people who find themselves in uh, an unplanned pregnancy. Well, they want to become un, they want to become unpregnant immediately, and so they they consider abortion as a way of becoming unpregnant, and then things will be back to normal. So if we go uh, to the you know if we go for a mechanism or a quick fix, you know all we need are more public executions, or all we need is to expel people of a certain type or ilk. And then everything will will be better, and that uh, apparently seems to absolve us from taking any responsibility for discernment, for compassion, and leading people to reconciliation and, and healing. We want our listeners and to be stop. part of the conversation. Uh, we want you to call us at one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. Text us at the same number one eight seven seven five one one five four eight three. Bishop, we have Mary on the line from Jordan, New York. Mary, go ahead. You have a uh, you have a question for us? Yes, I do. I just wondered um, if you you probably are you and the bishop both are probably aware of a woman named Bella Dodd who was a communist operative who worked with the Freemasons back in the late 30s and 40s. And her job was, as the Freemasons wanted to bring down the church, which they still do, um, 
her job was to infiltrate the seminaries with homosexual men, and she later repented or got in. She was in touch with um, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, Mm -hmm. and they met several times. She converted to Catholicism. She repented of what she had done, and she has written. She wrote, at least she wrote it all down. I don't know if if it's actually a book that's published, but it's it's well documented that that happened. And Mm -hmm. um, the thing is that now, and she admitted that she put in at least fifteen hundred in in a small area. She put in at least fifteen hundred young men who who were homosexual on purpose. So those seminarians would perhaps be of an age to be higher in the episcopate now you know um it's well, just well, it doesn't it doesn't solve the current problem but mm-hmm. when i when i've spoken with some people who are very frustrated about this especially non-catholics who have said kind of like well see we knew you know this church is corrupt right. and this kind of thing right um yeah. by bringing that fact out to them mm-hmm. sometimes Get less, they get less uh, accusatory. I, I see. Well, well, thank you, Mary. Uh, I'm sure the bishop and I will want to respond. Bishop, do you have anything to say about the the story of Bella Dodd? Are you familiar? I'm, no, I'm not familiar with Bella Dodd. But I'd like to. I think what Mary's pointing to uh, is also at least to look at some of the causes of this and right. some of the realities in the culture of seminary, which, besides abuse of power. Since you've got an entirely male environment, you do Mm -hmm. have to look at the issue of homosexuality, all Mm -hmm. right? And and as far as which is which is a very multi pronged topic, all right? Yes. And and yet, most especially behavior and how behavior fosters inclinations Mm -hmm. has to be addressed, especially now in a culture uh, that that has a disposition. For promotion of lifestyles that mm-hmm. are that have no consideration of chastity, whether it involves uh, same-sex marriage or whether it involves just simply cohabitation uh, right. in the heterosexual communities order, and so that that changes the cultural horizon at which seminary formation takes place and also mm-hmm. evangelizes. But um, you know. This this has to be addressed as well, honestly, uh, yes. and and also with honesty and with with justice in light of the truth as we understand it and as it's been revealed to us. Right, I, I know that uh, Bishop Marlino of Madison, Wisconsin, wrote a pastoral letter, and he talked about a a subculture in the clerical world of people with the same sex attraction. Uh, and again, it, it's a it's a complex issue. Uh, and I think we live in a culture now, and especially in the past few years, where where license and absence of, of restraint and absence of clarity about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, uh, what it means to be called by God in his image and likeness to, to serve him in both body and soul, a lot of the vocabulary, uh, a lot of the cultural supports that uh, fostered clarity and and self control and and contrition etc. A lot of that has been swept away in, in recent years. Bishop, would you agree that we're uh, that we're facing a tremendous moral problem, and somehow our moral compass has been misplaced? Oh, uh, that's an understatement, which is uh, <laughs> probably I'm, I'm given to those, you know. Yes, yeah, understatements. I'm, 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 yes, fair enough. Um, I would say there's a metaphysical problem as well. There's a, there's mm-hmm. an under there's an epistemological problem as well, mm-hmm. and uh, I would say just in our United in, in the culture in the United States, at at the heart of this is a radical individualism, which mm-hmm. can only be interpreted through the ego. All mm-hmm. right, and I want what I want when I want it, and mm-hmm. so oftentimes the determinant of a vocation becomes so introspective. As far as something that's fulfilling, a, only in a sense of is this something that's going to make me happy in this priesthood, somehow a career that I'm going right. to find fulfilling? Well, that that's that neglects some very key points. First of all, mm-hmm. that you're called by Christ and you're to be configured to Him through the cross, right? And that you're you 
you are to lose yourself. Now you have to know yourself mm-hmm. and to to accept yourself in light of God's grace and also in the mission entrusted you to give yourself honestly and totally. And that's mm-hmm. what formation has to be directed towards um, and not just simply kind of a, a, a self-help approach to life. All right? And I think I think the culture itself is just lost in an egoism uh, and, and uh, somewhat solipsistic, and so um, which fits, you know, a, a vain approach to, to human life. Right. I, you know, I, I've uh, met with folks who ex- were trying to explain why they were interested in ministry and said things like, well, I, I wanted to get into ministry to make more space for me to be me. And I said, well, I'm really sure that that's that's not going to work. And, you know, when I was a a new priest, I was asked by the Office of Student Life to uh, talk to the students about spirituality as an aspect of wellness. And I said, look, I'm the priest of a crucified God. I don't think I'm qualified to talk about spirituality as an aspect of wellness. We're we're living in a culture that is not only um, in a moral vacuum, but it, we, the, we live in a culture that seems uh, resolute to not turn to Christ and to not turn to the cross. And whatever the remedies may be going forward, they absolutely must turn towards a, a clear-eyed, wholehearted, humble turning to Christ and his cross, because that's the only access to the resurrection. When we come back, we're going to look at the possibility of going forward, of finding hope and healing. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I worked in pro baseball for a long time, and we play on Sundays. And it was an easy excuse. Uh, I took the easy out and just didn't go to Mass. Got caught up in that whole selfishness, that whole, you know, um, I can do it all. The times when I was struggling were the times I needed God the most. And now that uh, I've come back and accepted God, my world has completely changed. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for any reason, visit CatholicsComeHome.org today. A while back, I had a nice little chat with some Jehovah Witness ladies, and they tried to justify their claim to be Christian by saying the early Christians didn't believe Jesus was God. Is this true? Well, of course not. Let me share a few examples. Take John 1.1, where John describes Jesus as the Word and writes the Word was God. Now, in order to get around this, the JWs translate the phrase as the Word was a God. But this is based on a misunderstanding of Greek grammar. Consider also Colossians 2.9, where St. Paul writes, For in him, that is Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In 1 Corinthians 8.6, Paul describes Jesus as the one through whom we exist. Isn't God the one ultimately responsible for the existence of things? So, contrary to what the JWs think, to be Christian, you must believe Jesus is God. I'm Carlo Broussard with a ready reason for Catholic Answers, catholic.com. You're listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Call into the Catholic Current this hour at 1-877-511-5483. Shortly after today's show, visit our page for The Catholic Current at thestationofthecross.com. Here you'll find a link to Father McTague's recommended reading list and a link for downloading the program so that you can share it with your family and friends. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, the host of The Catholic Current, where we plug into the power of Jesus Christ and His Catholic Church. You are listening to the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network, where we proclaim the truth with clarity and charity. Our guest this evening is Bishop Michael Olson of Fort Worth, Texas, and we're addressing the difficult question of what to expect next from America's bishops. 
In the first segment, we looked at the problem relating to current revelations and scandals. In the second segment, we looked at public statements from from the Holy See as well as from other bishops, including Bishop Olson. In the last segment, we looked at roots and causes of the problem. And in this segment, we're going to try to find reasons for hope, to look for light, to look for resources so that we can go forward towards healing, towards justice, and to the resurrection. Uh, Bishop, we got a... Um, a survey question from an anonymous listener who wrote, I hear all about how angry everyone is, but I want to hear about chastity, that is, a virtue. Could you talk some about about virtue as a way of going forward in this difficult time? Certainly. I'd like to, I'd like to start with the issue of anger, and then I will move to chastity as well, because I sure. think that, that would be a helpful order. Um, right. A- right. Anger uh, is uh, only helpful when it is directing us towards conversion and uh, in a sense of what would call righteous indignation, all right, which yes. is the anger of the prophets, uh, mm-hmm. the prophets who are called to proclaim God's desires for us. And mm-hmm. So we are righteously angry because this is most clearly not part of what God desires for us or why his son died for us. Now, mm-hmm. anger, however, in our culture is a basic way of life whereby we see the destructiveness and uh, and in it turns to destruction is the destruction of the unfocused activist that just wants to tear down all right yes. and, and to be controlled by rage all yes. right and i would say as catholics and as, as those who've been baptized in, into christ that uh our, our anger should should be a sign of hope only if it's righteous indignation it leads each of us to conversion all right, and not private conversion, a corporal, a corporate conversion or ecclesial conversion. Mm-hmm. Chastity, mm-hmm. all right, chastity is an ancillary virtue of justice as well as charity. All right, now, mm-hmm. uh, I I think at times then then also chastity needs to be fostered of an integ an, an in- integrated sexuality for each person's station in life, both in the mm-hmm. order of nature and in the order of grace, mm-hmm. directed towards their ministry. So chastity, both in word and in thought and mm-hmm. in action, uh, is very important for seminarians and for priests and for bishops, uh, because uh, our human formation has to make, uh, make clear our conformity and configuration to Christ, head and shepherd of the church. Yes. All right, so that we need to be clearly directed towards the mission and caring mm-hmm. for Christ's people. All right, now that requires an integrated prayer life, and in Christ, mm-hmm. and it requires a humble self knowledge and awareness and a firm purpose of direction shown by actions. Uh, yes. This has to be renewed in seminary life because of. Uh, the dominant culture, which doesn't recognize uh, chastity any more than it recognizes charity, all right? right? And that where where we see that it's it's an odd culture, all right, to say mm-hmm, the least, mm-hmm. where where sexuality has become publicized by by expectation, and marriage has become privatized by preference yes. and expectation. And that right. that is an inversion of both the natural order and also the graced order that we're called to live by as the church. Right. You know, Bishop, when I was uh, teaching at a university as a young priest, and, and this is where you know, everyone had discovered AIDS for the first time and some of the purported preventive techniques for regarding AIDS, and there were students walking around with enormous posters with graphic depictions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then I said, well, why don't you do so, you know similar depictions of, of the, the Sacred Heart of Jesus or Our Lady of Fatima? They said, oh, but religion is private. That's too intimate. Right. So this is the culture that we live in now, that there is, uh, is a complete inversion. I want to go back to something that you said earlier, Bishop. You, you said that there's not, what's called for is not only an individual conversion, but a corporate conversion. And, and then I look up and I see we have a text from an anonymous listener who said, you know, there are lots of people demanding that we call out the bishops or we call out the pope, etc. cetera. Uh, would this actually help or... What, what what's needed? What would corporate uh, repentance, conversion, 
look like and what will facilitate that? Well, I, that's an excellent question. Um, I would say, I would start with, I think that it's already been in process. All right. And it's, mm-hmm. In other words, that, uh, when we look back on, for example, the Pennsylvania study uh, or the mm-hmm. Pennsylvania grand jury report, rather, mm-hmm. uh, heinous, absolutely awful. Yes. All right. And, right. Uh, and all but 2% were those that happened before 2002. Now, those are people, though, traumatized that yes. live with that trauma to this day. Yes. So that's not to minimize that. But there's also been, I think, better screening, and it needs mm-hmm. to improve. There's mm-hmm. been um, more intentional training and preparation for safe environment uh, mm-hmm. and for how to recognize the signs of this before it happens. Right. Uh, for setting up, for, for you see, it, while policies themselves aren't going to help us, good practices lead to good policies, which we turn to better practices. Mm-hmm. All right, and mm-hmm. it calls us accountable. All right, right, to that the policy itself, policy does not lead to good practice in itself because it turns a mechanized view. But our but our approach is we have to practice well. And it just begins with charity and caring mm-hmm. for those who are most in need and yes. being preventive. Like, you know, whether it's um, this issue, but I mean, or, or even the use of alcohol or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, it, there, we are always responsible to other people. All yes. right, and responsible to care for other people, most especially for those who are more vulnerable. Hence, the responsibility of fathers and mothers for their children. Yes, you know, yeah, they're, well. they're the first teachers. They're, they're the, they are absolutely the the first protectors. What I keep coming back to, Bishop, is is to go forward. We we have to be both uh, truly human and truly Christian. Uh, one of my concerns about going forward is the. Um, the the effect on, on recent revelations and events on the morale of priests. In fact, one of our survey respondents, Bill from Hamburg, New York, said, I, I'm sorry about the da- doubt cast on priests uh, who are faithfully uh, performing uh, their their duties. Um, what do you say to priests who are who are discouraged, uh, who are losing heart, um, again, who who are who just are, are wondering, you know, why do I get out of out of bed in, in the morning? Where where can there be the light in their lives? What do you have to say to them as a bishop? Well, first of all, I, I would say, uh, you know, what I what I try to do myself, and that's to begin every day praying for gratitude for the invitation that Christ has given us to share His vocation of priesthood, mm-hmm. because it's still a gift. Um, mm-hmm. We're not just apparatchiks in an institution, all right. right? But we are. We have a real personal, relational vocation that's entrusted to us to Christ, that He's not just left us with alone, all right? right. But requires our ongoing conversation with Him, as our as our Lord and as our friend, as our mm-hmm. King and as our. Ex- all right, and so that's the first start. I would say also to take heart. Like uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, someone asked me, uh, you know, about uh, the seminarians, and they said, "She said, well, how can you be a priest in this environment?" And my response mm-hmm. to that is, "How can I not be a priest in this environment?" Right. Right. Because precisely that's the nature of the call: is to combat this sort of thing. Right. All right, and you see that type of question. When I ask that question of myself, when I find myself asking that question of myself, I go, "Well, I'm making this about me." When yes. in fact, the very nature of my vocation should first have Christ at its mm-hmm. center, yes, and His people or others, right. secondly, and me third, yes, and and that order of priority can very easily be lost. Um, yes. Even with the best of motives, right, right. The 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 culture 
uh, fosters uh, selfishness. It fosters careerism. And, um, you know, a, a well-intentioned, generous priest can be uh, eaten alive by absolutely infinite demands. You know, even if there were 36 hours in a day and he didn't need to sleep, uh, there still isn't enough time to do, to meet all the needs, to do all that, that could be done. And I think the first temptation of a busy priest is to cut corners on prayer and to cut yeah. corners uh, on the sacraments. And, and that is a, an infallible recipe for uh, d- disaster, you know, if you're too busy to pray, you're you're too busy, um, and I think you know we're we're too busy not to pray. Uh, so, I think you're right, Bishop. Right. That that sense of priority to, for the love of Christ, to love the people whom Christ loves, and to love them as He loves them. If we don't have it in that order, then we can't possibly go forward. That's correct. A love beyond effect and and a, and a love beyond security, you know. Right. Quite frankly, it's the the love of the cross. Mm-hmm. Yes, we, uh, and that and that I think we we need to recover. We need to retrieve our our commitment to a spirituality centered on the cross. I know that September fourteenth is the feast of the triumph of the cross. I, I hope that that all Catholics in, in every diocese can uh, can do something really special on that feast day. I, I think a recommitment to the the triumph of the cross and the call of the cross is essential for going forward. I would hope so too. Right. I think right. that the cross is to be central. Otherwise, it, it, we lose Christ. Right. And, you know, um, if we only play at being sinners, we can only play at, at being saved. And that's why I think any renewal, any genuine going forward um, as, as the, the people of God uh, has to start with, with confession. I, I think the, the first step in nearly every spiritual issue or crisis is it's time to go to confession again. Yes, Absolutely. I also I also recommend I think uh, prayers to the Blessed Mother are absolutely yes. necessary, and essential, uh, because yes. she she helps us know her son. Yes, Bishop, thank you very much for being with us on the Catholic Current. Could you give us a blessing before we go? The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty May Almighty God bless all of you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much. This is Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus, your host for this episode of The Catholic Current. We've been speaking with Bishop Michael Olson of the Diocese of Fort Worth, Texas, and we hope that you'll tune in tomorrow for another episode of The Catholic Current here on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross. The Station of the Cross is a listener-funded nonprofit organization. If this podcast has helped you in your spiritual journey, please consider making a donation. Donations can be made through our website, thestationofthecross.com, or by calling 1-877-888-6279. You can also donate right through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. Thank you for listening to and supporting the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of truth with clarity and charity.